All right. So I'll get I'll go ahead and get things started. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for uh, or welcome to tonight's Wednesday night at the lab. Um, my name is Jaime. I'm going to be stealing uh, Tom's thunder for tonight. Uh, my name is Jaime Cordova. I'm a uh, graduate student and the chair of the Darwin Day Committee uh, for as part of the Crow Institute for the Study of Evolution. Um, before uh, I get started and introduce our speakers and our, pen or our um, moderators, um, I'd like to first say thank you to the rest of the Darwin Day Committee who's helped and make this uh, week such a great event. Uh, that being uh, Chris McAllister, uh, Emily Seddon, Tabitha Favor, and Dr. Prashant Sharma and Dr. Nicole Perna. Uh, and with that, uh, again, thank you so much. If you'd like to learn more about the Crow Institute for the Study of Evolution, uh, you can learn more about us at evolution.wisp.edu. That being said, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. Um, so tonight our panel is, uh, we have a great panel that's actually international and it's the first time that we've ever been able to do this. Uh, so it's a plus side to being able to do uh, to do Zoom. Uh, first, we have Dr. Gemma Geegan, a senior lecturer of microbiology and immunology at the University of Otago in New Zealand. Uh, we also have Dr. Aspen Reese, assistant professor of ecology, behavior, and evolution at UC San Diego. And then we have Dr. Paul Turner, the Rachel Carlson, professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at Yale University. Um, our moderators for tonight are Dr. Caitlin Pepperell, Associate Professor of Medicine and Medical Microbiology and Immunology here at UW-Madison, and Dr. Con Dr. Tony Goldberg, a Professor of Epidemiology also here at UW-Madison. Um, and with that, we'll have Dr. Aspen Reese start us off with our, our first uh, half hour with a series of short lectures. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, man. Thank you for organizing. Let's see if I can get my screen share to work properly. It's the problem with going first. Um, okay, hopefully you all can see that. Um, I am really pleased to be taking part in this. Um, and so thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I guess I'm here to present the side of some of the useful things or the good things that the microbiome um, can do for us or what interacting with microbes can do for us, um, even or perhaps especially in a time of global change. So whether we like it or not, we live our lives um, in connected to microbes and there are lots of reasons why we should like it. In fact, our relationships with microbes underlie some fundamental aspects of biology and animals and plants have evolved to support microbes, which help them do all sorts of things, including uh, getting nutrition. So um, the bacteria that live in association with cows um, in their complex stomachs help them digest carbohydrates that they themselves can't break down. Um, and animals like this wood rat here have uh, bacteria that live with them that help break down toxins in their diets. Um, some ocean animals like corals or these deep sea tubes um, rely on their microbes for all of their nutrients. They don't even have mouths, right? So um, there are sort of more nuanced relationships, right? Animals like bears um, rely on their microbes to help buffer against seasonal variation. Um, and in the case of bears, they even help prepare for and survive hibernation. But it's not all metabolism. Uh, the skin microbiome of frogs and the endosymbiotes of these P. aphids help protect against pathogens and parasites. And microbes can also contribute to things like behavior. In the case of uh, scent signaling in animals like cats, um, the scents themselves are actually being produced by um, microbes. Trees can communicate super long distances via um, fungal networks below ground. And um, in the case of bobtail squid, they rely upon luminescent bacteria to help them camouflage, so it protects them from predators um, by counter illuminating their bodies. So this light is actually being produced by a bacteria that they grow inside of their bodies. My work primarily focuses on the gut microbiome, uh, which is arguably the biggest and most complex host associated microbial community. In humans, it plays a much bigger role than just helping digest our food, although it definitely does that too. Uh, changes in the microbiome help drive development as we age, including training our immune system and altering body condition. It helps protect against pathogens and provides necessary nutrients and vitamins. And the gut microbiome is even believed to shape our behavior and thoughts. Of course, not all microbial behavior is good, and I'm sure we'll be hearing a bit more about that later. Um, microbes can act selfishly or just in unhelpful ways, driving infection, malnutrition, obesity, and other non-communicable diseases. So we have to figure out a way to balance our needs and those of our microbes. 
Um, a good example of this really complex relationship is reflected in the evolution of how we arrange our gut. So we want primary access to nutrients that are easy to break down in our food, but then we don't wanna waste everything else. Um, so we rely upon microbes to just break down the rest of it before we excrete it as waste. So in order to sort of balance this, we try to keep microbes out of the small intestine, which is where the high density um, diet materials available initially. And then in the large intestine, we want bacteria to be able to grow where just these leftover nutrients um, are available. To achieve this, we rely on chemistry and immune activity, making the small intestine inhospitable with um, sort of an acidic environment, high oxygen levels, which are unappealing to the anaerobic bacteria in the gut and lots of antimicrobial peptides. Um, this produces microbial densities that are um, almost tenfold lower in the small intestine than in the large intestine, which is just a much nicer place to grow. The needs um, and thus the gut physiology of other animals can differ though. So in ruminants uh, like the sheep or that cow I mentioned earlier, um, they put the bacteria at the beginning of their GI tract. So in these complex multi-chambered stomachs that they have um, where they break down uh, you know, the cellulose and other carbohydrates and grass. And then they have these really long intestinal tracts to then take up those microbially released metabolites. Uh, in contrast, high gut fermenters like this capybara um, also rely on many microbes to break down their plant heavy diets, but they put their microbes in a giant sac called the cecum, which is in the middle of the GI tract. So they have much shorter small intestine and they do much of their um, my metabolite take, uptake in the cecum as well. Uh, something like a dog, in contrast, has a gut in, that's very similar to ours in architecture, but is overall much shorter since they're mostly eating an easily digestible diet. Um, this means if you have a dog, uh, like mine here, this is Shambles, um, who really likes eating plants in the garden or out on walks, there's really no hope of them getting any nutrients out of them because they're lacking the right microbes and the sort of necessary length to actually get those nutrients out of the plants. Altogether, we see these really fundamental signatures of evolution in animals that reflect our longstanding interactions with our microbes. But as the environment changes around us, we and our microbes have to change too. So depending on the environment you experience, um, which may have novel diet components, um, a new parasite or climatic changes, the microbiome may change in ways to help you survive it. And in fact, there's evidence that the human microbiome has changed in response to each of these different variables over the course of our own evolution. Um, this may be through altered microbial composition, behavior, or signaling that then regulates your own gene expression. And Together, these changes can help buffer against new conditions, um, potentially even providing a needed function, which your own genome doesn't have. Um, this microbial plasticity then provides time to adapt or lessens the need to do so under dynamic environments. My lab uses domestication as a model environmental change event um, that was expected to uh, impact the microbiome to study these dynamics. Um, we focus on domestication because it was a relatively recent evolutionary process that was replicated in a bunch of different animals. Um, there are known selective pressures and known ecological shifts associated with it, right? So in addition to selecting dogs to be cuter and more useful, um, we now feed them very different diets, right? Um, than what they would have eaten in the wild. What this means is that the microbiome is really different. Um, so I'll just show you some very basic data here, but what we found is that the microbiome of something like a dog is much more diverse than that of its wolf ancestors. Um, but this isn't, uh, it turns out, just reflecting those long evolutionary trends. In fact, it's a really um, dynamic process. So when you feed a dog, uh, meat, uh, like a wolf would eat, or if you feed a wolf dog food, um, you can toggle the composition and the diversity of the microbiome. So a dog that's eating meat loses diversity and starts to look more wolf-like, and a wolf eating dog food gains microbial diversity and starts to look more dog-like, even over very short time spans. Um, so what this means is that the, the ecology or the environment is what is shaping the microbiome and potentially in a way that then um, sort of sets the terms for what these animals are able to do. Um, looking at the genes specifically carried by the microbes which change, we find animals eating domestic diet um, have increased levels of metabolism genes which are necessary to break down things like starch and sucrose or other carbohydrates that are present at much higher levels in dog food than they are in the wild diet. 
Uh, what this means or what we interpret this to mean is that microbial responses, which could have happened much faster than host evolution, um, help these animals eat human fed diets and potentially allowed early dogs to survive until eventually they actually evolved those pathways themselves. So nowadays dogs also have genes on carbohydrates that wolves lack, but they probably got there first because their microbiome was able to um, break down those, those carbohydrates. What we found is that looking at other domestic animals, um, there are changes associated with domestication, but they're not always the same. So in fact, we see opposite trends in mice, uh, where the composition and diversity in lab populations is much lower than what we see in wild animals. Um, this likely reflects the fact that the lab is a really simplified environment, right? Where mice are fed easy to digest foods in infinite amounts. Um, they're protected from pathogens and predators. And there's probably just less need for a complex microbiome. So they've undergone a sort of streamlining process. Um, these changes are really important to recognize though, because we use mice as the main model organism to study the microbiome as well as most other things in biology. And it seems that we're studying a community that's not what it evolved with, and it's not necessarily sending appropriate signals or functions to the host such that it would recapitulate natural biology. So while domestication associated shifts in the microbiome clearly helped dogs and maybe to some extent mice, it's important to realize that some changes may not have been as helpful. So for every increase in something valuable like digestion or vitamin production, there may be a loss of something else valuable like barrier function or an increase in a negative trait like inflammation. The relationship between the functions that the microbiome provides is totally unknown right now. Um, so we can't predict how the microbiome will change in the future, um, whether under natural um, ecological change or under medical manipulation, which really limits our ability to use it as a target for increased host fitness or host health. Really, the only thing we can say for certain is that there will be microbes and they're going to matter. Um, so we need to understand the dynamics of these systems to predict how they might change, if it will be helpful, and what, if anything, we can do to help advance these changes in the future. And that's um, you know, the very simple problem that I've set up for my, my lab to work on. Cool, thank you so much. Uh, that was a, that's a really interesting project, and um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions during uh, during the Q and A. And uh, I, I I'll, I'll say as a, as a kind of a host, uh, I have a little bit of bias because I worked on bacteria stuff. So, um, but the viruses is going to be really cool too. I'm really excited to learn to learn about viruses now. Uh, so next, all the way from uh, the University of Otago uh, in New Zealand, uh, we have Dr. Gemma Geegan. Thank you. I'll just share my slides. Um, okay, hopefully you can all see that. Um, okay, so I guess I'm an evolutionary virologist. Um, I come from a very evolutionary background and um, use viruses as a model to better understand evolutionary processes. Um, and I guess um, we all know that viruses jump hosts a lot. Um, and this is the... Um, virus emergence is really characterized by host jumping, um, where a pathogen such as a virus jumps from its reservoir host species to infect a new host species. And this is the case with um, if not uh, most, if not all um, emerging viruses in humans and other animals. And um, so I guess the highest stakes question in disease emergence is what's going to cause the next pandemic, where and when um, this is going to emerge. And I guess my um, research tries to better understand how host ecology and behavior um, might be able to, uh, might be shaping um, the viruses that a particular host might carry. And we can quantify host jumping by looking at phylogenetic trees. So if we say that this is a phylogenetic tree of a bunch of viruses that share a common ancestor, and this is um, a phylogenetic tree of the host from which those viruses were isolated, and if the topologies of these trees perfectly match, um, you can say that the viruses and the hosts have co-diverged. Um, so when a, when a host is speciated, so is that virus. And on the other hand, if the topologies of these trees mismatch, we can say that there has been cross-species transmission events. And it is easy to quantify this um, uh, 
you know, between and among uh, virus families by um, using a standardized topology distance. So this just measures the distance of, of that mismatch. And just um, a, sort of a summary of, um, of some virus families um, that infect a broad range of hosts, we can see that there's lots of squiggly lines, which means that there's lots of host jumping. Um, so host jumping really characterizes the evolutionary history of viruses generally. And we can quantify this further. Um, for example, RNA viruses are more likely to um, jump host than DNA viruses. And as we add taxa to these virus families, so if we, as we discover more viruses, we're going to see more host jumping events. Um, so overall cross species transmission is an extremely prevalent trait among virus families, which tells us a lot about virus evolution. So viruses like to evolve by jumping to new hosts. Um, but I guess what the confusion is that people try to understand how they can predict pandemics from these sorts of data. And I guess my argument is that we see um, patterns of host jumping on, on macro evolutionary scales. So we're talking about millions of years of, of evolution. But um, on a pandemic scale, we're talking about a few years. Um, for example, the closest ancestors that we know of to SARS coronavirus 2 is still about 30 years divergent um, to the, the one that's circulating in humans at the moment. So we really need to, um, to make sure that we understand the differences between microevolutionary scales and macroevolutionary scales when we're interpreting trees for, on, on a virus family level. So disease emergence is, um, is obviously this complex interplay between the host and the virus. And it's really between the genetics um, of both the virus and the host, as well as the, the host ecology. So for example, say we have um, a donor host, uh, let's just take influenza for an example, which is happily circulating among birds. It's, um, and it's maximized its fitness. But when it jumps to a new recipient host, it has to undergo um, some changes genetically because birds and humans are quite different. And so when it makes that leap across the species boundaries, there is a dramatic um, drop in fitness before it then it gains the necessary adaptations to become fit in that recipient host. So it needs to overcome this fitness valley. It also needs to um, get through a bottleneck, <laughs> which can be extremely small and, um, and also reduce any genetic diversity that's being transmitted. Um, so when we look at um, the genetics and ecology, um, we can look at some examples that quite, quite nicely fit into these boxes. So for example, um, influenza virus that worked really well is swine flu because um, pigs and humans live in sort of quite densely population, quite dense populations. They have contact with each other through farming and um, they're both mammals. So the genetics and ecology kind of match. Um, so what doesn't work so well is that um, humans have ample contact with poultry through, through agriculture. However, because they're birds and we're mammals, um, the, the genetics of the, of the virus doesn't quite match. So um, bird flu isn't transmissible yet between humans. An interesting example where the genetics gets a tick, but the ecology doesn't, is um, equine-derived canine influenza virus. So this um, first emerged in dogs at, um, through greyhounds at racehorses, from racehorses, and then it got into the domestic dog population, but it never really takes off very well in dog populations because dogs don't live in populations. And so the population ecology isn't, um, isn't really working for, um, for canine influenza and it really just exists in, in dog shelters. And what's really lacking is um, the natural reservoir host for influenza viruses, such as wild aquatic birds, because um, not only do we lack ecology that, that allows those jumps to occur, but um, we also lack the genetics. And what really needs to be considered in trying to better understand um, evolutionary dynamics of, of disease emergence and viruses is, the differences between the short-term dynamics 
intra host dynamics, which can create a lot of genetic diversity within um, within a host in that in that infection. Um, but on a comparative level, when we see the long term dynamics of um, across a population, for example, that we see in SARS-CoV-2, um, we we almost um, you know get rid of all of that um, genetic diversity through the bottleneck. So an evolutionary genetics approach really needs to come into play when we try and understand intra and interhost dynamics. And, and also, also, I guess, one of the misconceptions about, um, it's about virus virulence after a host jump and virus virulence um, and how it evolves. Well, there's precedence for virus virulence um, increasing after a host jump, such as um, SIV to HIV, um, seeing the same, such as um, canine influenza from equine influenza virus kind of stays the same. And there's a presence for it decreasing and then later changing as well, such as um, some fish viruses that have occurred. So um, there is a sort of fallacy to assume that virus virulence will always evolve to become more avirulent over time, but it will only change if um, it is going to increase or not, or the transmission rate. So um, I guess that's one of the most main major misconceptions about um, the evolution of viruses and their hosts. So at the very broad scale, we do see patterns of um, virus host co-divergence when we look across evolutionary history of viruses generally, um, where mammals um, are, are more sort of more recent um, viruses, but they have deep evolutionary ancestors of viruses in, in lower vertebrates, um, such as fish and uh, bony fish and jawless fish. And it's really interesting when we study these viruses um, in, in other vertebrates, because um, viruses that we only thought infected mammals, such as Ebola virus or um, or flavy viruses and things like that um, are actually all found in fish. So um, I've been, I know this is supposed to be about mammals, but I've actually been kind of scoping around fish for a while now because um, fish have probably um, more viruses than any other class of vertebrate. And we found really, really interesting evolutionary patterns when we look in, at fish viruses because sometimes in the virus family, such as in, sorry, um, sometimes we find evolutionary patterns such as they exist at a really basal position, so they match that um, co-evolution of the vertebrate tree of life, or there's um, there's multiple fish lineage viruses that are scattered throughout these trees. So. Um, for example, in flavy viruses, there's um, fish viruses that are in multiple lineages, whereas in um, phyloviruses, for example, which is Ebola virus, Amargo viruses, fish viruses tend to sit at the very basal, really divergent um, viruses. So when we look at these evolutionary trees, um, fish provide an enormous amount of insight into sort of maybe the age of these viruses and, um, and how they evolved through the vertebrate tree of life. That's it. Stop sharing. Um, awesome. Thank you. thank you so much. I'm going to have a couple of questions. I'll probably have a couple of questions for sure about the uh, change in virulence when jumping from from a different host. So that's pretty interesting. Um, next, uh, so uh, but I'll save my question for the end. Uh, next, uh, we have Dr. Paul Turner from Yale University, who will uh, close off our uh, short lecture section, and then we'll go ahead and go into our panel. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation, and thanks to everybody here in the audience who's joining us. Uh, great to follow two wonderful talks, and uh, completely unplanned. I think mine is a bit of a bridge between the two, as you'll see. So let's try and do this. And we'll go like that. All right, so uh, what I'd like to talk about is predicting evolution of virus emergence, which as Dr. Gingen mentioned is very hard to do. And yet uh, we would like to attempt this because it's obviously of biomedical importance. Uh, 
So um, a little bit of a reminder, the overall goal then that I'm talking about is, can you better predict when virus emergence is going to happen and especially which viruses have the most potential to do this? So this uh, generates a, a whole list of related questions. One way could, you could think about it is why are some viruses good at doing this? Why are they good at infecting multiple hosts? And uh, if we can call them generalists, are the generalist viruses just more likely to emerge on hosts such as humans? So scattered across this slide, we have three examples. And mostly I want to emphasize that emergence is difficult because it's a catch-all term. It's hard to come up with generalities. When you're talking about on the far left, uh, the problem that we're dealing with right now in a pandemic, this is a brand new type of a virus. You know, we see coronaviruses, but this type of coronavirus is very novel to humans. And it has the potential to spill back, to sort of move back and forth between humans and other animals. Whereas HIV is something that has non-human prim uh, primate precursors, came into the human population and got locked in, as far as we can tell, at least for the most part. And then on the far right is something yet uh, different as well. These are viruses that circulate in humans as influenza viruses, but uh, very many of them, in fact, uh, most of the global population exists outside of humans. So how are you going to predict when these things happen in the future? What we like to do is consider this through the power of experimental evolution in the laboratory. So I'll just give you a couple of slides as an example. <clears throat> uh, one thing that we have keyed in on for the ecology is that emergence can occur quickly versus slowly. So if you think about the potential for a virus to jump into a novel host, it could be immediate or it could be something that is seen as more or less a luxury if it's able to keep replicating in its current host and yet get a foothold or toehold in the novel host and then over time uh, gradually evolve to deal with this gradual host exposure and to gain an advantage from it, that those are really different scenarios. So this uh, graph here is to illustrate that if you consider this proportion of novel hosts that are existing in the environment, ranging from none of them to uh, all of them being present, then over some time course, you could consider in the laboratory a virus as a model here, Sindus virus, a member of the Togaviridae family. We can set it up as multiple populations that are experiencing these different treatments. So the green would be the most rapid if we just basically take these viruses and put them into a completely new host and see how they do evolutionarily. Whereas the other extreme would be to allow them to gradually see those new hosts and eventually those new hosts take over the environment. So what we wanted to do was examine this question and it was led by one of my former graduate students, Valerie Morley. Uh, here are a couple of snapshots from her work and it matters a lot, basically. The answer is yes. Under gradual host invasions, what we see is that there's a consistently uh, higher fitness gains on the novel host when this gradual host invasion occurs. So let's look at this busy graph in the lower left. It's basically grouping all of her very many lineages, which are all shown here as red symbols, in these different treatments. And the control would be if you just uh, don't allow these viruses to shift onto a new host, they just evolve on their current host. But what you can see is that there's a nice trend here. Under the most gradual kind of invasion, these points start to cluster. That means they're sort of doing it phenotypically or they're growing uh, similarly in terms of their fitness. Whereas as you move away from that, and if you're looking at these viruses being challenged to jump immediately on the novel host, they do it in very many different ways when you measure their fitness. And over here on the right, this is a way of looking at in these different groups in the treatments, how different are these virus lineages from one another after this experimental evolution happened in the laboratory? And you can see that you have this decline in their genetic relatedness or their nucleotide uh, diversity. They are more similar to one another here to the right, and then it's consistent with them sort of doing this in the same way. So what I'm trying to get at is that you can create an experiment like this and look for generalities about uh, the degree of exposure to new hosts and whether it matters evolutionarily, and indeed it matters a lot. You can go further, and this was some follow-up work that Val did in her thesis work, is considering now the virus genome that she was working with. It's, a, you know, it's only a handful of genes really compared to something like human. But what you can do over time is here on the left under this rapid new environment uh, exposure, so they have to jump onto the novel host immediately, over the course of the experiment, you can measure the variation that is happening within this population. 
And at these different loci, the different genes across the genome, you can track as mutations come in and eventually take over at that locus. But what this arrow is showing you is you can just barely make out that these are two lines that are pretty much overlapping. That means that two mutations came in at that locus at exactly the same time, suggesting that they were interacting with one another. If you put these viruses, here's another example of another one of her lineages, in this uh, other end of the spectrum, a gradual host environment exposure, then you get more complex dynamics. And I'm now showing you two of these black arrows, suggesting something that I'm gonna emphasize further in a moment, that the kind of molecular evolution that happens in this gradual change is different and it seems to rely more on gene interactions solving the problem. And that is summarized in this paper from 2017. And this is just kind of a busy graph to say that if you count up these kind of cohorts or mutations happening together versus as singletons under a gradual change in the environment, this gradual exposure to a new host, you have a very consistent and statistically significant result that for some reason that there is more interaction with mutations happening here to solve the problem of evolving on the new host relative to when they have to jump immediately onto a new host. So now I'm gonna switch gears entirely and talk about maybe you could consider the good side of viruses and how they can solve problems for us, but I'll eventually get back to the same kind of similar questions we would wanna ask if we deploy a virus to do uh, some work in your body and to solve a problem, we would be perhaps worried about it emerging on your um, bacteria that reside within you on your microbiome. So let's go there. Uh, this is a problem that is a bit in the background as we deal with the pandemic, but it is not going away and it's getting worse literally day by day. And that is uh, resistance to antibiotics is a global problem and we cannot control bacterial infections nearly as well as we used to. So the sobering projection map is by 2050 saying that this is going to be a leading cause of death in the human population. And depending on where you go, if, if uh, population density is higher, then you're just gonna get more deaths because there are more people living in those regions. Here on the right is what you might be able to do about this. Even before antibiotics were discovered, these uh, phages, which are viruses that are specific to bacteria, were known at that time. And people had done some early experiments to see if they could act as therapies. So what you're seeing in this cartoon is this phage or this virus that's specific to bacteria. It's interacting with the bacterial cell, taking it over its metabolism to turn it into a virus production factory and to make copies that could then go on and infect other bacterial cells of similar type. So that's pretty cool because that means it's a self-amplifying drug and we generally don't have those in biomedicine. It's very efficient. So we have been using this because increasingly bacterial resistance to antibiotics is problematic this threatens lives and what you could do is step in with a personalized medicine approach. You could do in the very classic way here on the left, a member of my lab team, Ben Chan, he's looking in, in the environment uh, in the vast biodiversity of phages on this planet to look for those that we characterize in the laboratory here in the middle that might have some good properties that they might just wind up in a person very soon after. So he's here in a hospital room in Texas showing a young woman who has a genetic disease called cystic fibrosis and uh, this lends itself to unfortunately very difficult bacterial infections that enter her lungs and they could be deadly because they could be uh, multi-drug or pan-drug resistant to antibiotics. He's showing her a vial of these phages that she's gonna inhale over a multi-day period to put them in her lungs and see if they can solve the problem. So others have been doing this and I included a couple of uh, cit citations for that, references for that. But overall, what we try to do a bit differently, I'll try to quickly describe. You could choose any phage to do this, but we have this uh, diagram from a recent review that says an innovation would be to find phages that kill the bacteria, but then they steer the evolution of the bacteria down a path that's good for biomedicine. So imagine this hypothetical bacterial cell here, and it has these proteins called efflux pumps that pump antibiotics out of the cell that they can get in. If you find a phage that is specific for these proteins, when it binds to that cell, it's gonna enter and kill. And the mutants in the population of bacteria will evolve resistance, but they'll do it in a way that compromises the function of these proteins, making them incapable of moving antibiotics out anymore. And you essentially use a double-edged sword to solve the problem. A faster example here would be this purple capsule. If you find a phage that's specific to it, that capsule, which ordinarily shields the bacteria from the detection of cells in your immune system, they might need to solve the phage problem by evolving uh, to change the capsule or get rid of it altogether. And that means they'll be less virulent. So this kind of stuff works very well. 
but admittedly, we're working in a black box. And if you take the emergence questions that I gave you earlier and turn them on their head, you can see some very similar goals are in mind here. How can we better predict which phages have the potential to kill a large number of target bacterial genotypes? And why are some phages just naturally better at infecting multiple bacterial uh, strains? But this could have a downside. Are these generalist phages that we would like to use in biotechnology? And frankly, they're being used ever more and they're uh, increasingly going into clinical trials. Uh, are they going to be likely to emerge on microbiomes? So does the phage therapy affect bacteria traits other than the ones that I said we could predict? Are they gonna affect the resident microbiome? Are they gonna uh, affect other phages that are naturally in and on your body, in your virome? And what about your human cells, other non-target bacterial pathogens, as well as non-target pathogens altogether, um, being viruses and fungi that might be in the person at the same time. So that was a very quick run through of both emergence as well as virotherapy, trying to convince you that similar questions lie at the root of both of those uh, goals. One on the, on the one hand to try and prevent things like we are trying to live through right now. And on the other hand, higher, uh, harnessing viruses to do work, but making sure that they don't escape from our control. Great. Uh, so Caitlin Pepperell here, one of the moderators. Um, I want to thank the speakers and uh, I'm going to get started with a question for um, Drs. Geegan and Turner. Uh, so SARS-CoV-2 is arguably the most intensively studied virus to date. Um, has any aspect of its evolution surprised you or is it uh, sort of following the, the playbook that you would have expected based on your research and experience? You want to go first, Dr. Sure. Um, it, it's not really surprised me. Um, I guess what the most interesting thing about SARS-CoV-2 is that everything is playing out in real time. So um, we are sequencing and sharing genomes in real time and learning about the virus in real time and getting vaccines developed in real time um, and look and seeing their escape in real time as well. So um, it, it's not that anything surprised me because it's fully um, what viruses do. Um, the, the, I guess what some of the um, more like surprising results um, but are fully justifiable or are things where um, certain lineages have emerged with um, no apparent intermediate steps to get there. And, um, and the, the role that perhaps um, immunocompromised hosts play in, in those, um, in the emergence of those lineages is probably really important. And, um, and, and that might need to sort of be an area that um, we need to better understand. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. So I, I guess it's not surprising that we see the virus evolution happening in real time. I mean, not only do we get the evolution of the emergence event, but we've got these new variants popping up that uh, we're quite worried about them escaping vaccine coverage. But the fact that they're occurring is quite, um, quite uh, um, predictable. And the fact that you're seeing what's called convergent evolution, so that you have in different geographic regions, people getting infected by the wild type or the typical variant that started the pandemic. And now you're starting to see these different variants with properties that are you know, the same in a way, similar mutations popping up. That's because there are certain ways to solve a problem and evolution uses at its disposal what it has. So if you see this recapitulated in many places, it makes complete sense. I would say the, the thing that surprises me though is just this annoying ability for this virus to be completely asymptomatic in some people and deadly in others. So that is uh, a characteristic of a pathogen that we just haven't really been dealing with before. And now that it's at a pandemic level, it's pretty bad. You know, you would, um, in a way, you could deal better with a pandemic if the clinical symptoms are very constant because you know who's infected. And this has been the very difficult thing is you don't know absolutely who's infected. So this is where the, um, the particular biology of the system meets with the struggle of biomedicine based on our expectation that the pathogen would have some of the similar rules of pathogens that we've dealt with in the past. And it really does not. Yeah, I've, um, one of the things I've thought about with respect to the asymptomatic transmission is 
this virus has traveled very efficiently. Um, and uh, one of the things I've thought about is that um, people with totally asymptomatic uh, infections are not going to modify their travel plans, whereas somebody who's got a, even a, a mild infection may, um, without thinking about, you know, are they frankly sick with something. So I think a, a truly asymptomatic infection really uh, promotes long distance travel. I think Thanks Tony's for, the, up. for the answers, keepers. Uh, I'm Tony Goldberg, the other one of the moderators tonight, and I will follow up with a question for Dr. Reese. Um, I, I saw at the beginning of your presentation, Dr. Reese, that you uh, you talk about this interesting this interesting phenomenon that's always fascinated me: that microbiomes influence everything about our biology, including our behavior which has always kind of been so intriguing. So I was wondering, could you, I mean, not to put you on the spot, could you like maybe describe an example of, of an aspect of our behavior of any animal's behavior that is shaped by the microbiome? And what do we know about the mechanisms whereby microbes say in our gut can influence our behavior? Sure, this is not my area of expertise, but I like, know enough to vaguely speculate. Um, it is definitely the case that um, various not friendly uh, microbes change behavior. So there are a number of prominent pathogens that have behavioral effects. You think of like rabies, which makes animals hang out with other animals they wouldn't normally see, um, which makes it easier for them to jump between hosts. Um, it's also something you see with um, like toxoplasmosis, right? Someone who studies virology should maybe be able, should be able to, to fact check me on that one. <laughs> um, where you see mice become less afraid of cats uh, and then the cats can actually spread it to humans, which can be problematic. But in terms of more uh, uh, non-dangerous mechanisms of behavioral effects, uh, what we see is complicated um, hormonal signaling that's happening from the gut, for instance, um, either because they are producing or consuming um, hormone precursors. So like some amino acids that get used to make hormones that then are sent from the gut to the brain um, are consumed and produced by microbes in the gut. Um, it's also the case that there seems to be evidence that um, microbes have preferences consume or how you spend your time. Um, this is less anthropomorphized and less intentional than it sounds, but that um, animals which are conditioned on certain diets and have microbes that are used to that diet, if you transfer them into other individuals, um, will then have the same preferences for diet um, composition, even though that animal they're now in has not previously been exposed to those choices. Um, so we think part of this might actually be happening in the domestication story that um, there might be some behavioral aspects where if, for instance, if you give a lab mouse a wild biome, that they will actually prefer to eat wild food because they're better equipped to break it down. Um, and because it, you know, gives them other rewards, both through hormone and like um, basic metabolism pathways. Thanks. The, the, the joke here is that uh, with, with one of our collaborators, Rachel, we, I've, I've joked with her that if you took the microbiome from a chimp and put it into mice, I would expect the mice to form fission, fission fused in social groups and start to pant. That's how strong some of these effects can be. <laughs> it is the case that we seem that we behavior has evolved in part to help share microbes. Um, so you can correct me, Tony, if I'm wrong about this. But my understanding is that most of the time when chimps are grooming one another, it's not like they actually have like parasites on them, so they're not always picking off ticks. And it seems like part of what they might be doing is removing fecal material, um, as well as other like sloughed skin cells and things like that, that serve as a means for bacterial transfer. So primates that groom one another have much more similar microbiomes than individuals that are in the same troop, but don't have the same social connections. I asked for mechanism and I got it. <laughs> Great. All right, I'm going to hop in. Tony and I are trading off and I'll hop in with a question for Dr. Geegan. Um, about uh, the evolution of virulence. Um, so you mentioned the relationship between virulence and, and R-naught as a reflection of transmissibility. Um, 
which speaks to the role of positive selection in the evolution of virulence. Uh, and I wondered if you could comment on the role of um, chance events uh, or genetic drift um, in the evolution of virulence. So situations where virulence in a particular host is not tightly tied to fitness slash transmissibility. Yeah, you. Um, I mean, you would definitely see the effects of drift having um, having some effect on virulence in an individual level, but I can't see how that would play out at a population level if you um, if we didn't have. I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, transmissibility is is always going to. Um, to make a virus more fit and um, at a population level, I would have thought that that um, would have taken over any effects on on drift if it if it didn't, um, you know, also affect transmission. So, yeah, I was more uh, thinking about situations where virulence is uncoupled from transmissibility. So certainly, anything that affects transmissibility um, is going to be selected for. But yeah. are there examples where the virulence of the virus is, is just irrelevant uh, from, to its fitness slash transmissibility? Um, it's, I mean, it's a good question. I, I know some of examples where, it, um, where viruses can still be transmitted after death. Um, for example, in... Um, rabbit myxoma virus, um, you know, flies can, on carcasses can still transmit um, the virus, for example, but I don't know of many examples where it would never have any effect on transmission. I mean, Maybe I, I guess, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, if I understand the question, I, I guess it's reminding me, I don't know if this is a good example or not, but polio virus, because polio virus is, um, it's in the environment and you can pick it up and it'll actually pass right through you and you would never know it. The problem is when it gets into your nervous system. So the whole reason that we have a poliovirus vaccine is the circumstances where it gets into the nervous system and messes up limb development or it could be very extreme and cause mortality. So um, that is virulence from our biomedical standpoint, but it's like a dead end for the virus because as far mm -hmm. as I know, unless there's new research on this, once it gets into the nervous system, it can't get out. It has these dramatic effects, but it's not like it's fostering its transmission. It's more like an opportunity inside an infected person for that virus population to go to some tissue and use it. But, you know, it doesn't really get a transmission benefit from that, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Most, um, so for bacteria, uh, most of the bacteria that we think of as, as human pathogens are transmitted actually in a commensal state. Um, and in, in many situations, I mean, we're obviously concerned about uh, invasive disease and dying, um, but uh, for many bacterial pathogens, those uh, events are irrelevant. <laughs> They're just, you know, offshoots of uh, their main game, which is for, you know, for Staph aureus, for example, getting from one person's nose to another. So, so, so we have a, a question here that I'll, uh, I'll ask from Kirsten in the audience and maybe uh, expand upon it just a little bit. And I think this is probably best for Dr. Turner, but anyone can jump in. Uh, the question is about how, um, microbes in a body actually, how, how might they be able to fight viruses? So you described the great example of phage therapy where viruses can fight bacteria, but are there examples of the reverse where there are other types of symbioses we can take advantage of as, as treatments for viral disease? That's a good one. Um, so is the question kind of like if you alter the microbiome or if you do, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I think there are people are starting to discover these ways that microbes and their signaling and their communication to one another, say even in your commensals and you know, maybe Dr. Reese knows more about this than me because I'm totally armchair on it. I mean, some of these things are 
leading to, uh, they could be leading to physiological changes in you that could benefit you. So I, I said that very purposely vaguely <laughs> because I don't know the details, but I, I can imagine scenarios where um, that interaction of some microbes, including residents that are always there. Uh, I mean, maybe this is sort of the best example I can think of is in early childhood, if you're seeing certain pathogen infections then it primes your immune system in the right way. And I think we have enough evidence for that now. Um, am I way off track, Dr. Reese? No, no, that's right. Um, you certainly see a lot of immune system training that happens via the microbiome, um, particularly early in life. Um, so this is why kids who grow up on farms tend to have fewer allergies and also maybe um, be less uh, sort of susceptible to certain infections later on. Um, but the microbiome can also more directly impact things. It's rare that you see bacterial like eukaryotic virus interactions. Direct, uh, so it's not like the bacteria are doing anything to the viruses, but they can uh, like incite the host to produce more protection themselves. So in the nose or the respiratory system, you see like mucus thickness is in large part in response to uh, microbial signaling, um, even in the absence of infection initially. And it's really hard for viruses to get through mucus <laughs> to get to your cells um, so they can get stuck. Um, it is the case that uh, bacteria definitely play a large role in fighting off bacterial infections, um, but this is just a really fun biological fact that I feel obliged to share with everyone, which is that they can, bacteria can use viruses, so phage specifically, to fight amongst themselves. Um, so they use them as like little weapons to knock out other bacteria that they don't like or that they're competing with. Um, so it gets very complicated very quickly and you do have these cross kingdom interactions happening. Interesting. Let me throw in one more complication. So what we're seeing, and this is a bit in the literature, if you deploy phage therapy, those phages can enter your cells and they're not replicating in your cells, but they can cause an interferon response. So now let me just make things up. So imagine you've got a bacterium that is really supporting those phages you know, in the body. And a side consequence of it is that those phages are entering your cells and pushing your cells to produce more interferon that could protect you against certain viruses, okay? I think that's plausible. Um, I actually don't have a concrete example of it, but it sounds completely plausible from the evidence I've seen in the literature and the kinds of things that, that we're studying in, in my group. <clears throat> so I have a question for Dr. Reese. Um, my understanding is that uh, humans and domestic dogs um, swap microbes, that there's some melding of their microbiota. Um, do you, have you thought about this interaction? And do you think uh, that the microbiota of humans and dogs could have manipulated our behavior to make us cuddle our dogs and um, <laughs> allow, uh, allow them to enter a, a broader niche? Uh, it's possible. <laughs> I think that <laughs> Um, certainly in early dog evolution, they were just like hanging around humans and not necessarily in our houses. And it certainly is the case that for most of dog evolution, they weren't um, occupying such a prized place in our households. Um, they slept outside and there wasn't a lot of cuddling per se. Um, so whether or not the very recent trend towards, um, you know, treating dogs like children has led to further shifts in the microbiome is unclear. Um, I don't think we have a good time series of that, but you could imagine comparing between uh, various populations, right? So there are feral dogs and there are dogs that are still outside or working dogs mostly. And then there are like cushy dogs that have beds they sleep in or worse yet sleep in your bed. Um, and you would expect that there'd be increasing similarity between the dogs and the humans in terms of not only what bacteria are present, but like the very particular strains. Um, you can see signals that they, they're they going back and forth. Um, whether or not that does anything or is just like a random process that happens when two things are close, um, is unclear uh, still. I, as far as I know, no one has tested this directly, but um, you certainly could imagine studies in which um, dogs that have more human-like or less human-influenced microbes um, are then given, you know, behavioral trials to see how, how cuddly they are, for instance. But um, I think that 
the initial or the strongest selective forces were probably for allowing them to, you know, put up with being around humans, which is a behavioral thing. Um, and there's lots of, you know, genomic change that happened that caused that, but there may also have been microbial genes that were involved in tolerance of humans. Thank you. All right, well, I've, I've got one now for uh, Dr. Egan, he's amenable. So th this is, this is again, you, know, you might recognize this is uh, somewhat of a debate that is go I've been interested in following between certain of our collaborators. Uh, do you think there is a true deep phylogeny of the RNA viruses that links all of the families together? And if there is, do you think it's attractable thing to infer that phylogeny? And, and finally, if you do, because I've been, I've been asked this question and I have no idea how to answer it. What, <laughs> what, what is the, the common ancestor of all of the RNA viruses look like? You could reconstruct that common ancestor. That's a really good question. I've often wondered the answer to that question, to be honest, and I have no idea how to answer it. But um, I, I mean, you see these super um, super orders where they encompass, you know, a large proportion of virus families that you can trace an ancestor um, back to. I mean, there are lots of theories about the origin of viruses um, that they come from the RNA world, and um, and it, honestly, I have no idea if um, if they could these super families could be. Uh, have a common ancestor and what that would look like. But um, it, it's certainly possible because the rate at which RNA viruses um, evolve and adapt can, um, it, it, you know, it's certainly plausible that they might have shared a common ancestor. And at this point, I, I don't think that those relationships could be tractable through just sequence homology, but perhaps it, if we have a better understanding of um, things like protein structure folding and um, stuff like that, I think at a different level, there might be some homology we could, we could trace that evolution, but that's a really hard question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I owe you a beer for asking that one. <laughs> I've just been asked it so many times myself that I have to put you on the spot. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, can I, can I jump in? Because I, I love virus origin questions because I don't study them and I wouldn't touch them with a 10 foot pole, but I'm happy to muse about them. And um, yeah, it's, I don't think viruses trace back to the same origin, but I'm not a phylogeneticist like Dr. Gigan. Um, I think that they, some of them could be ancient and hear from the virosphere that came about after the RNA world, whereas others might have evolved yesterday from Tony's liver for all I know, you know? So, um, but what I, here's another question that we'll never be able to answer is if you go back in time, are there sort of rules by which viruses can um, make a living you know, if you consider them alive? In other words, when pre-mammals, you know, when dinosaurs were more flourishing, did they suffer with virus diseases that you could categorize in similar ways as the current day? But those lineages died out because they were so specific to those organisms. So did they have like, you know, large genome size DNA viruses that are herpes virus-like or even herpes viruses if they date back that far? And did they have, you know, short genome sized, very acute infections with RNA viruses? And I, I think this is all kind of in the realm of trying to figure out rates of virus extinction, which are very, very difficult to even consider because we have a poor sense of and microbes, what are the rates of background extinction happening on this planet? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And um, I mean, if we look at the uh, vertebrate tree of life and um, I'm doing like metagenomics on lots of fishes, uh, um, especially jawless fish, you know, these are hundreds of millions of years old before the dinosaurs. Um, first vertebrates, they have a hell of a lot of viruses. Um, they're the ancestors of viruses that infect us today. I found in influenza virus, Ebola virus, um, coronavirus, and in these jawless fish. And, um, and you know, they're not, um, I sampled fish from um, the wild. I've sampled fish from food markets, um, you know, that are deemed healthy, I guess. And, and they don't seem to be causing disease, but these viruses exist in huge um, abundances. So is a coelacanth 
more resistant to viruses? Would you it's a, good, it's a really good question. Honestly, I don't know about <laughs> much about um, fish immunity. Um, I think there, there needs to be some um, some more knowledge gained in that area yeah, because people, they, they have so many um, viruses that um, don't seem to be causing any sort of immune reaction that you can you can measure. Um, I want to know what a coelacanth microbiome is like too. Yeah. You know, and, you know, it's pretty cool. And since this is Darwin Day, there, you know, there is a fossil record of viruses, and it's in our own genomes. There's been a yeah. long history of integrated viruses and vertebrate genomes, which can tell us something about um, past infections. But that's that's a that's a nascent field. So, um, Dr. Geegan, I was just going to ask if there's an example of a fish to human virus jump. No. <laughs> Um, no, thankfully there's not. Um, I think um, people would be pretty scared to eat fish if, they, if there was. But the, so um, the vast majority of human um, emerging infections have come from mammals um, because, uh, you know, the genetic barriers are just too great. And, and about half or more of um, vertebrates are fish and the diversity between fish orders is greater between fish and humans. So fish are drastically diverse animals. Um, and the, the, there's, they tend to be, even the viruses among fish orders, taxonomic orders um, are quite conserved. Um, and, and it really, you can see the, the virus, um, viruses in fish have often co-evolved among fish orders. So to jump between fish and humans is um, just, I think a too greater leap for, for the virus to have. So we have a, a question from the chat about uh, whether the fish viruses have any negative or positive effects on the fish. That's a good question. I mean, obviously there are fish um, causing, path, uh, virus causing diseases in fish. There's a lot of them. Um, but the, the ones that might have been circulating in fish for hundreds of millions of years may have, um, evolved to probably do nothing. Um, <laughs> I don't know if they're benefiting from it. I, I wouldn't have thought so, but um, they don't seem to be having overt disease. So um, they're likely not really doing much, but it's just a really uh, new area of, of virus discovery that, um, you know, there's a lot of unanswered questions in that. Or, or maybe the uninfected fish didn't get caught. Yeah. <laughs> so jamie i don't know how uh we're doing with time i know that with the official session we're uh supposed to be going till about eight but what do you think <clears throat> i think we're good on time i mean we uh we we definitely have some more questions from the audience um so we can go on a little bit longer i think uh, i think that's okay as long as it's okay with our our uh, our speakers and we we did uh, talk about that beforehand. So. so yeah, so let's take some more questions. Okay, fine. I forgot where we are in the uh, back and forth. Um, I can jump in. Uh, okay, there was a question. It it just follows on this line of thought. Um, what are there any examples of beneficial viruses to humans other than bacteriophage? Anybody else want to go? <laughs> go ahead, Aspen. Well, I don't know if they were beneficial at the time, but there are um, genes that are now in our uh, like genome that are really useful <laughs> that came from viruses. Um, probably the most notable example is that some of the like the original fundamental genes necessary to make placentas, so that had to arise before placental mammals and marsupials split, are clearly of viral origin, um, which is totally crazy, and it's unclear what they did for the viruses. But um, we, as like a group of of organisms, wouldn't exist if it hadn't happened. So that seems kind of useful. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That's a useful one. Yeah, otherwise, <laughs> none of us literally would be sitting here listening to this unless uh, that had happened long ago, predating the evolution of placental mammals. Uh, but I, uh, 
Yeah, I can imagine there are many things we have yet to discover in the virome of humans because they're not as well studied as other microbes and microbiomes. So I, I guess I'll just make that claim tonight <laughs> that when we more intensively study viromes, we will better understand how some viruses that are hanging about outside your body, on the exterior of your body, on the inside of your body are perhaps doing you quite a bit of good. Um, plausibly, definitely, you know, priming you somehow to be protected against other viruses that might be able to attack you and infect you. So I, um, I think that those are discoveries that mostly have yet to occur, but it uh, seems like that would be the case. Oh, we have um, a question here from Hunter, who's asked the $64,000 question. And the, it is, uh, other than influenza viruses and coronaviruses, which virus do you believe poses a significant pandemic risk to humans? So this is the predicting the next pandemic virus question. And the winner gets a Wisconsin cheesehead hat with a platypus. <laughs> Wait, with the platypus? Wow. That's right. I know. Dude, it's just high stakes. In, in, in honor of our a friend, of our a speaker from Oceania. Got it. Wow. And anyone want to give their guess first? And then when the next pandemic comes around, you'll be proven right or wrong? <laughs> I don't want to be right. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I remember I, literally being in a room with Tony Fauci and like a thousand other virologists in uh, January of 2020 and he's showing these maps of wow this looks kind of more concerning than we thought and gee we should have paid more attention to coronaviruses based on what happened with MERS and SARS coronavirus one we're so laser focused on influenza virus pandemics that this should have been enough to caution us that those two events could lead to something as bad or worse and I'm telling you, literally, people were turning when I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I think Tony has a good point here. And literally, what, month and a half after that it was a full-blown pandemic. So uh, it's hard to predict, as I was saying earlier, and Dr. Geegan was saying, and I, I just, uh, uh, I tell you, Ebola virus scares me. But somebody tell me why I shouldn't be so scared of Ebola virus. Um, yeah, I agree about coronavirus. I mean, um, there's seven coronaviruses that have emerged in humans and five of them have emerged in the last 20 years. Um, and so it seems that the frequency of virus emergence in humans is increasing and they all seem to be quite commonly coronaviruses. Um, so, and there have been um, people that said that we should be looking at coronaviruses a lot more closely than, um, than we did. Um, Ebola virus is scary. Um, HIV is scary, um, you know, and and um, it's just that we have really good drugs to to deal with it. So there's there's definitely um, scary things that could cause the next one, but um, there there's definitely more coronaviruses out there too. <laughs> so Paul Hedge, Gemma's going with coronaviruses. And Aspen isn't saying anything. I don't think, I think that, you know, my answer is probably as like useful to anyone else's in the audience. <laughs> it's far enough away from what I do. Um, not that I don't really want the cheese hat and the platypus, but um, I think that I would just be pulling, like, are there viruses I can name that we haven't already named? Maybe, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm not sure that that's useful though. <laughs> I'm going back to the future with flavor viruses. You know, we had Zika, remember that? Yeah. In history. So there's like a whole bunch of more flavor viruses out there that are kind of people have been watching. Yeah. I mean, and, and if I could, I mean, Tony knows this very well and others in the audience. I mean, the, the deal with uh, um, ecosystem level changes on this planet that are benefiting mosquito distributions, uh, you know, that, that is what also makes it very difficult when you're talking about vector borne viruses and changes to our environments on a global scale that let mosquitoes flourish in some regions historically. Um, that's very difficult. That's like another layer of complexity because of the way that they're transmitted and another species benefiting from the warming of the earth. And uh, I agree with what Tony just said. Maybe he gets the hat. 
<laughs> and, uh, I'm a former plant pathologist, and I'd like to throw in the One Health angle that we, on the rare possibility, we could also have an agricultural o o crop virus that could really kill more people than even what we're seeing recently. No, and that's my happy thought for the day. Yeah, he's got some good doom and gloom here. Maybe we should talk yeah. about the cat. There was a question about cat microbiomes back here. <laughs> I, 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 will just, I will just interject that it is true that I think in these discussions of viral emergence, plant viruses get the short end of the stick because people rarely mention them. And yet there've been fantastic examples of really devastating plant viruses. We're uh, used to it. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I should know better being here on a campus with a very, uh, very excellent plant pathology department. Let, let me know when you get start talking about viroids because those are the ones that always amaze me. <laughs> I anyway, agree. Thank you I for mean, mentioning that. I mean, between antibiotic resistant bacteria threatening the food supply, domesticated animals and plants, and when you start layering in issues of virus emergence in these systems, yeah. you know, we, that's what we better be prepared for because there's a whole lot of populations. And increasingly, you know, we rely on food supply that goes through nodes. And if those nodes are highly vulnerable to this kind of devastating loss, I mean, not only financially is it killer for GDP, but you know, it really threatens food supplies and people will starve. So it's, it's very serious. Boy, that is doom and gloom. What's the cat question again? <laughs> yeah. Um... <laughs> I don't know anything about cat microbiomes, but I do think that someone should and maybe already is studying historic cat microbiomes using mummies from Egypt. And I think that would be really cool. That's cool. Oh, like that's that. that'd be fantastic. Yeah. yeah. That, like science does fun things too. It doesn't just make you sad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. There's a question from YouTube. Um, and I think Oh, okay. Two questions. I think this one will co go quickly. Any plant viruses hopping to humans? I'm pretty sure I know the answer to that one. Dr. Gigan? No. No, no plant viruses. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. Too, too, too big a divide. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. So, First, we need to talk the fish human divide. Then we, can yeah. <laughs> then we can take a giant leap to the plants. Over to yeah. the if it did happen, though, would it be a phytonosis? <laughs> <laughs> good. Couldn't resist. Um, um, no, that's good. Here's an interesting one. Um, and I think I see what Laura in the audience is getting at. Are there phages or other viruses specific for mitochondria or chloroplasts? Uh, Which is interesting because of the uh, theory of the evolution of cells. Yeah. That's a good one. I feel like it was, it was a thesis project that was budding in my lab group and nobody ever pursued it. Um, I, would, I would suspect that you should have genomic elements, including phages or prophages, that are very good at dealing with chloroplasts or mitochondria. But I, I don't do that work. I mean, that's a good question. They'd have to get through the eukaryotic cell first, though, right? So, like, I, which obviously does happen in some right. stage, but it is harder to recognize a eukaryotic cell and then recognize the residual bacterial cell that is now the um, organelle, right? Right. Totally agree. So, even though, as I was saying earlier, you can have your cells take up phages, I think there's no expectation that it's happening at very, very high rates to be able to sustain something like that that would be specific to uh, an organelle, but, you know, let's just say, you know, things in microbiology get missed for an amazing long period of time, like you know, CRISPR defense and bacteria, you know, took a heck of a long time to figure that one out. And it's more prevalent than, than uh, <laughs> it's just surprising. So, yeah, I, I think microbiology is just such a vast field and you know, we're seeing the tip of the iceberg of it. So these kinds of things that sound like crazy, didn't mean to uh, insult the person who asked that. It's not a crazy question. It's a, le <laughs> it's a left field question, uh, but, but it just might, just might be the case. Well, there's at least one uh, plant virus that infects a chloroplast. Um, so um, yeah, plants are cool. 
They are. So we have a, a comment from Chris Hittinger saying that uh, mitochondrial DNA definitely have homing endonuclease that replicate like transposons. So there you go. Yeah so, these, yeah, so these are DNA transposons that cut the mitochondrial genome, take advantage of heteroplasmy and can replicate themselves, at least in yeast. So, precedent. Hey, Chris. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, good to see you again, Paul. Good to see you. Huh. Wow. So we have another question from the chat or from YouTube. Uh, and this would be for Dr. Reese. Any evidence of where the initial bacteria that reside in digestive systems came from? Um, I think most of them have been in animals for quite some time, but they certainly have relatives that are environmental. Um, but particularly the anaerobic ones don't travel very well outside of us unless they can form spores. Um, so this is why like pathogenic bacteria typically um, are facultative anaerobes. Um, so they can grow anaerobically, not especially well, but they can also tolerate aerobic conditions because otherwise they wouldn't get outside us very easily. Um, whereas the stuff that is more beneficial or commensal doesn't travel very far um, and certainly doesn't hang around in the environment for very long. But um, all evidence suggests that these are things that were sourced from the area around us, whether it was soil or water at the time long, long ago. There are some organisms that are more empty than we are. So um, insects tend not to have a stable microbiome or some insects uh, like caterpillars tend not to have a very stable gut microbiome. And so when you sequence what's inside them, it's just whatever was on the plants they were eating. Um, and it's, the thought is that their guts are just too small. And so they push everything out before it can replicate and make a population that's stable. Do we know anything about uh, microbiome host jumps? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a actively contested uh, area in the field as to how <laughs> well co-evolved uh, uh, mutualists are often quite well matched to their host um, and have evolved multiple times, um, but often from the same lineages, but for things that are not necessarily obligate or that are just like sometimes vaguely helpful, um, you do see them moving around, but it's also then harder to track exactly where they started or, or what these relationships are. Um, so you can do sort of strain level tracking now, um, but we only have very short time series for these. We have essentially no historic data because no one has sequenced the mummies. Um, so it's really hard to look back in time what long-term trends look like. Do you think that a whole community would jump? Or, or well, part of a community? Like predators, they, their gut microbiome, they look like what they eat. Um, so especially in the wild where they are eating the intestines, they're just picking up bacteria from there. Whether or not they're doing anything useful is less clear. Um, there are exceptions to this. So like vultures have a very particular microbiome, but that's mostly because their guts are super, super acidic, um, which helps prevent them from getting sick from eating purposes, <laughs> which is a good strategy <laughs> if you're going to go around eating roadkill most of the time. But um, yeah, the problem is that when you eat something that eats other stuff that is different, um, those microbes aren't going to be super helpful necessarily. Mostly you see a lot of vertical transmission, at least in mammals, that they're getting most of their microbes from their moms. Um, and in other organisms, they pick them up from the environment um, and it's just like a filter that goes through. So it's not, fish don't look exactly like the water, but they mostly look like the water. Um, so for predators, do they, uh, does their gut microbiome look like their last meal and then switch to their next meal whenever they next eat? All right, how does that uh, there's some, like there's growth. And uh, the problem is that they often eat pretty consistent things. So if you're a, a coyote that's eating a lot of rabbits and, and mice and such, um, distinguishing between those is hard. But um, there is really cool work being done. This has nothing to do with bacteria, but using leech blood meals to like survey uh, biodiversity in areas that are really hard to sample. So there you can actually see what they were feeding on, what their last set of meals were. Um, usually leeches keep a blood meal in them for like a month. Um, so you can survey like a month's <laughs> worth of wildlife deep in tropical rainforests where it's really hard to go like count leopards. Um, That's really cool. 
the way you collect leeches is by walking around and waiting for them to grab onto you, which is not field work I want to do. No, but. I'll, I'll pass. <laughs> Well, I know we're uh, we're getting towards the end, so I thought in the spirit of Darwin Day, I would ask each of the panelists one final question, which is, from your own studies of your microbial systems, is there anything you found over the years that you think would have surprised Charles Darwin or made him rethink any of his ideas? I think this is an unfair question. <laughs> The youngest person on the panel. Of I have it is. The most fun. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that logic, but <laughs> uh, let's see. I mean, I, I think the the degree to which microbes are mutualists. Um, you know, I don't. I mean, Darwin. What would Darwin be surprised about? Kind of, Darwin didn't even know about viruses. So right. He might I mean, be surprised to learn about viruses. Yeah. yeah. That <laughs> that's <way>. my answer. <laughs> yeah. uh. I mean, I think maybe Darwin would be surprised that in virus evolution, you can see natural selection happening in real time. And I think viruses would, are the, probably the best exemplars of evolution and through natural selection. And he would have been a big fan. I think he would too. And I think that the variation that Darwin, of course, you know, this is the linchpin to what he was talking about is the variants matter. Um, yeah. A lot of our variation is viral. Yeah. I mean, we, we have within our genomes, plenty of virus derived genes. So I, I think that he would be surprised by that. I think that is all true. Um, I think that insofar as there is uh, like microbiome plasticity, but also heritability, it ends up working out in a sort of Lamarckian fashion. And Darwin might have been a little sad about missing the boat on that one. But <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Cool. If, if only he would have known about viruses and genes. Just think of how interesting his life would have been. <laughs> Oh, All right. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you so much uh, to everyone, uh, to our panelists, uh, Dr. Turner, Dr. Geegan, and Dr. Reese, and also to our moderators, Dr. Pepperell and Dr. Goldberg, for uh, for joining us tonight. As and to close off our uh, Darwin Day 2021 events, uh, which uh, have been a, a week long event, so this is a an, uh, a great closing for it. Um, you can all learn more about uh, the Crow Institute for the Study of Evolution. Uh, at uh, evolution.wisc.edu. And uh, again, thank you so much, uh, all of you for, for joining us. Uh, this was a really awesome panel and a really awesome, uh, great to hear about all your, all your work. So thank you everybody. Thank you, Jaime. Thank you, Jaime. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>